Well, good morning, everybody. If you're on the West Coast, uh, good afternoon. If you're on the East Coast of North America, and good evening from the United Kingdom, Europe, Middle East. And for those of us, for those of you rather joining us from India and the Philippines, um, thanks very much for uh, for tuning in so late. It's <laughs> it's pretty difficult to get a webinar where everybody can do it at work time. Um, I'm with Mike Shaw today on Larry Wilson Live. And a lot of you may have seen Mike as the producer of Larry Wilson Live, the last 22 shows. Um, and yesterday, if you happen to tune in yesterday, uh, I don't know if it's the epitome of irony, but uh, out of all the shows um, where Mike's the IT producer, the one that we couldn't make work in terms of IT was the one where he was on. But Mike is uh, a lot more than just the IT producer. Um, Mike is a former national uh, level coach, which is how I met him. He is a, uh, a speaker, uh, world renowned actually. Ted has got a TED talk on YouTube you can look at. Um, he's the author of a book, Never Part of the Plan. I don't know if you've got a copy of the book. Well, somewhere you can hold up for us, Mike, as you go. But anyhow, Mike. Um, Despite all of yesterday's technical difficulties, thanks very much for uh, sticking with us and uh, and coming and coming back today. Yeah. Um, to, well, to talk about all of this, it, it is kind of ironic as well, too, because there are, as we well demonstrated, things that are not human error or not necessarily human performance. We didn't do anything different yesterday than we'd done on any of the other shows but for reasons that i still can't quite figure out and you can't the internet wasn't working at your place right or yeah, the jet technical technical difficulties but i'm uh, i'm grateful to be here on this side of the the lens too being in the not being in the producer role today is interesting but i'm i'm thankful to be a guest and held to the same esteem as some of the other incredible guests we've had on the show. So thanks for having me. Well, no, you're welcome. I mean, but I think that, you know, it's uh, quite often, you know, people, when you're introducing, we're doing webinars or keynote things around the world. Um, you know, people just sort of, just, okay, he's the IT coordinator, but, um, you know, Mikey is also uh, a, a co-founder with me in Head Start Pro, which is, um, a training program for high performance athletes based on the critical error reduction techniques. And it's actually quite a, a long involved story in terms of how Mike and I ended up developing safe start performance and head start pro. And there was certainly uh, a, a great deal of pardon the pun education in terms of our endeavors with high schools, with post-secondary trade schools as well. So, um, you know, Mike, to be an author of the book, to be a TED Talk public speaker, you know, keynote speaker, uh, going around the North America making a living at that, um, and certainly being a national level coach, I, I think, you know, people, well, certainly I saw it quickly. Um, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of talents all in one there that sort of, like I said, came together to put this, to put this training program together. Um, you know, I, for those of you listening and a lot of you know me, I mean, Mike was the coach of uh, the British Columbia freestyle ski team. My two oldest boys, Taylor and Mitchell, well, my only two boys, Taylor and Mitchell, were on the team. I think they were the only two on the team that weren't old enough to drive, which is why you had to come over and pick them up, Mike. And uh, at the time, I don't think you were old enough to rent a car, as I recall. You just graduated from university. And um, you saw the Safe Start card on the island between the kitchen and the dining room. And you made the fatal mistake of <laughs> saying, so what's this all about? <laughs> and, um, all right, you know, my goodness. I mean, it's how, how many years now? Is that a good nine, nine, ten years ago? Yeah, going on ten years ago first time I saw safe start well so maybe you want to just sort of take it you know you can sort of take it take take it from there a bit um if you'd like you know and sort of what happened what happened next with the team and 
we'll just sort of try to take but, it in chronological order for everybody and try to keep it because it, it, never, it back never. and forth so we'll, we'll try to keep it as simple as we can you guys but it wasn't you know it was a little bit like pinball as opposed to a, a train track so we're going to try to keep it on track linearly <laughs> if we can yeah yeah I'll, I'll never forget the first time i saw well met you and learned about safe start i had um just started coaching the provincial elite athletes so i maybe i was maybe a year or a year and a half into my into my contract but uh i'd finished university i'd i'd um come off the back of a competitive skiing career before i actually went in and committed to going to school so i skied first as an athlete and then went into uh business management and then um got back into coaching back involved in sport later on and I remember asking you kind of what you did for a living and what was this this card that was sitting that was sitting on the counter and you started telling me about rushing frustration fatigue and complacency and human factors and how they um affect people at work and uh increase the likelihood of an incident and injuries and i said well did i ever tell you about the time i broke my ankle jumping into a foam pit off a trampoline at a gymnastics facility and now um a, a foam pit is generally not somewhere where you expect to break your ankle. But if you add in states like rushing and complacency, it's easy to see how you could have a, have a mistake even in a safe environment. And so that accident was the end of my competitive skiing career. What he and did, it everybody. Totally needless. It's what he didn't do. Okay. And it's, it's, it's a fairly advanced concept as opposed to just, you know, I didn't see the cord and I tripped and I fell. This is, I didn't check to see that the bottom layer of hard foam that's supposed to be over the concrete was there before you actually get to the foam chunks. So the foam chunks are designed to kind of be a bit like water. In other words, they don't offer a lot of resistance. They slow you down enough. And this thing at the bottom is obviously what keeps you from hitting the concrete um, hard. And that bottom foam piece wasn't there so he basically just landed like you know did a front flip and landed straight on the concrete and that was pretty much it for mr ankle and that is a concept out of the critical decision units because you're complacent enough not to check something might be in a bit of a rush as well or you might be a little tired don't want to bother or a little frustrated because it's supposed to be there and you don't want to check, but you could have checked before you jumped. You didn't, and it cost you an ankle. So that kind of, that is, like I said, that's a little different than I just didn't see the cord or I caught my heel on the step and the next thing you know, I fell down the stairs. There was a decision involved in that, um, in inaction, if you will. Um, but he told me that story, like literally from looking at the card. And then I remember you saying something about, you know, how do I get this to the team? And I said, well, you pretty much did it. I mean, that's all, you know, if you want it, you can have it. And I remember, I remember you saying at first, I asked the question, I said, how do I teach this to my athletes? And you said, well, I don't know. I said, but there's a way. I mean, you're the right person to ask. And so we, uh, we organized, uh, a team sponsorship and to and to deliver the units and i even got to go through uh or sit in on a train the trainer before but i don't know if you recall it was at that time it was shortly after that that i moved up to the national level like i got a, a promotion if you will and moved up a rung on the ladder to be working with national development half pipe skiers so i didn't actually get to go through the training with the with the with the team and and take them through the units which is something i wish i could have done of course but your uh, your predecessor jeremy did and uh mm -hmm. you know and i worked with i worked with them on that although you know i must say they did they you know, train the trainer they didn't they did most of it um and uh you know i remember interviewing them afterwards um we also when you went to the national team we also branched out into minor hockey because of all the concussions and so on. And for everybody listening, the, the idea was still very much here 
injury prevention. You were, you know, free. Uh, you're all probably aware of the concussions in hockey and football as being high risk sports. I used to make jokes with my kids about, you know, you should have played something safe like hockey or football. Freestyle skiing is not free. <laughs> I mean, it, it is like a hundred percent you will get operated on during your career. I don't think there is one pro freestyle skier that has not lost a knee, an ankle. Achilles tendons are fairly susceptible. Concussions, concussions have taken an awful lot of people out of the sport, an awful lot of people uh, permanently as well. Um, and then there's hips and backs and shoulders and so on. Um, thumbs, you know, there isn't a freestyle skier probably with a set of thumbs that works properly. So it, we were going in there to reduce the injuries. And a lot of people at the beginning were saying, well, wait a minute, you know, this is part of the game. Hockey's a rough sport. And we started looking at the statistics in terms of the number of fingers and toes that get amputated in the change room because somebody stepped on them with a skate. Or, or, or fell backwards onto a skate and severed their Achilles tendon. So that's not, you can say whatever you want, that's not part of the game, right? That's not hockey per se, but it's a very serious injury, right? And something that could be prevented if people were paying more attention in terms of eyes on task and mind on task. So slipping in the parking lot in your ski boots and breaking your thumb like what happened to one of mike's athletes again you know that can take you out of the contest but it's pretty hard to say that that's because of skiing so there were a lot of these kinds of injuries that were very perplexing very annoying and in some cases career limiting for some of these for some of these athletes so we were going in there to try to help with the injuries at the beginning and things started going pretty well with the all-star with rep hockey at the midget level in the interior in the okanagan um we had a few hundred kids in the first test group and uh, i think a couple you know, hundred more in the second one and then i was down in breckenridge colorado with the bc freestyle ski team with the boys and Jeremy, their coach, and I saw you at the gym at Silverthorne, Mike, and I remember saying to you that, you know, like it's going now, Mike, it, like what you got going, it's the train is moving. And I said, if you wanna be at the front of the train, which I think was, you know, should be your choice, you started it, you, you can't, like, if the train's going 60 miles an hour, I can't, like, I can't stop it for you so you can get on the front. You know, you, you got to kind of get on now or you're not going to be at the front of the train. And I remember you looking at me and going, yeah, I know. In other words, you know, you weren't arguing or disagreeing with what I said, but we both knew your coaching career was doing super well. Like, mm -hmm. You'd gone from provincial to national very quickly, and that was going very well. So I just left it with you. So what happened next? Well, I, I remember you saying that, like, don't stop living the, the rock star lifestyle or the skiing, the skiing life, because it really is a, it's an incredible place to be. But, um, let me know when you're, when you're ready type of thing. And I didn't think I'd be as ready as soon as I was. I ended up um, moving on and going to another competition. It was at Copper Mountain and Half Pipe World Cups. So my athletes were on the world stage. And I'll never forget, it's December 16th, 2013. I, I walked out of the, the door of the rental house and you can probably visualize this if you live anywhere in north america sort of above the southern states but i walked out the door and the air was cold and crisp we're in the rocky mountains the sun is shining it's a beautiful blue sky day but this the snow is sparkling in the trees it was a perfect day to go and uh and ski half pipe and so we head off to the mountain and i had four athletes in this world cup pipe event and 
we were doing official training from nine until noon and the training went well. Everything went to plan. I was being a technical coach, giving responsive feedback from the bottom of the pipe as they were skiing through and preparing for their runs. And at noon, the half pipe was closed to us. And um, two of my athletes were feeling prepared for the event. So they went back to the rental house. There were another two who were feeling um, understandably nervous. They had uh, not for a lack of trying, but they just hadn't got through all of their all of their tricks that they needed to perform to put together their run. So I said, let's go over to this other part of the mountain. We'll go to the terrain park and we'll go and hit man-made jumps. And you can do your tricks on the jumps so that you and your right. half of the tricks and you take them to the pipe in a day and a half. Deal, deal. We go there, those jumps, they're closed. So what do you think happens to the athletes? They kind of shut down on me and I... I said, okay, we'll find somewhere where we can take some air. And we did. We found a, a pile of snow, which had been um, created by a man-made snow gun, which if you can visualize it, it's like a high-powered water jet that um, that shoots over top of the run. And there's this big pile of snow. I say, if we go fast enough, we can take some air off here. And um, the, first, uh, the first time I went to go and hit it, I said to the guys, hey, careful. I'm going to do what I call a safety trick here. Because uh, for one, the snow could be punchy. And um, what I mean by that is that the snow that yeah. comes out of the snow gun, it forms in different layers. Sometimes it can be light and fluffy or wet and dense. And so you get these crust layers that you can punch through to lighter snow underneath and it can throw you off balance on landing. So I'm going to go and do. It, yeah, in a nutshell, artificial snow is it, it looks from a distance like snow. But it doesn't feel like it. It can be a lot. It, it can be a lot stickier it's just because there can be so much more water content in it right it can be so much stickier yeah and um it's not like mother nature's white stuff that's for sure and so like you can stick on it you can punch and so i say i'm gonna go first and i'm gonna go and do what it's a safety trick and it's just a a 360 one full rotation i can do it on any jump i've done it thousands and thousands of times and so I'll go first. I go into this, this roller and I pop and I do the rotation and I come down and I land kind of heavy. And what do you think happens? Well, nothing happened. Actually, I, I landed it perfectly and I skied away and you run. Whoever's listening out there is probably like, Mike, you jerk. Why are you hanging us out to dry like that? But I landed it and it was fine. And we're, our tricks went from 360s to switch or backwards 360s. 540, 720s, even backflips. And um, and it wasn't long before I was back up at the top and I had coached my athletes through um, the tricks that they needed to do. I had done a 720 the run before and it was Garrett. Garrett, one of the athletes came behind me and crashed. And so I said, this time you go first and I'll come down behind you. And um, the two guys went and did their tricks. They landed it. It was all good. And then it was my turn to go. And I remember setting off down the hill and going from wearing sort of my coaching hat, working with the athletes to my skiing hat. And I was already moving. And um, I was on the way into this uh, roller and there, into this big pile of snow and something didn't feel right. And I looked up and I saw that there was a, we actually had a cameraman with us. It's all on video, but um, you can look it up. On, on Red Bull TV if you want to see the whole thing. But there was a cameraman there who was filming a skiing and it looked to me like he was standing right where I wanted to take off in the middle of this big pile of snow. But I went, why would he change what he's been doing? He's been doing it all after. And even if uh, he is, whatever, it's just a big pile of snow. And besides, I've got to catch up. All my athletes are already gone and I am moving. I'm going down the hill already. And I went through this process awfully quickly and I decided to go 10 feet farther to the left. And I remember coming around out of my 720, I landed what I thought was feet down, but I got hit, boom, in the face, uppercut immediately when I hit the snow, the wind I lost from my lungs. I was tumbling down the hill in this chaos, just going, oh, when did what happened? And I felt it, I felt this big impact to my face and a brief but sharp pain in my neck. And then nothing. I tumbled and slid to a stop face down in the snow. And I just let off this loud, no, like, no, 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 God, no. A brief but sharp pain in my neck. And then nothing. 
I was laying face down. My goggles had come down over my mouth and nose. I was breathing into them and I couldn't roll over. I just broke my neck. And not only did I break the neck, I ended up paralyzing myself in that moment. I knew because I couldn't feel my body and I couldn't roll over. <sighs> I'm sorry. You got a picture? My, uh, my athletes came to my side and, um, my athletes came to my side and which was, I'm so grateful for, and they helped pick me up and, um, get me flown to hospital where I had two titanium rods and 10 screws surgically installed in my neck. Um, this was intended to stabilize the spinal cord which was being crushed at the time by the position of my neck. I basically dis I bent my head so far backwards. And to give you a bit of uh, the reason why it happened, I landed in something with that punchy snow I was telling you about 10 feet farther to the left was not where I'd been landing on the hill the previous times. But you might imagine that doing a, a one full rotation, a 360 on my first jump, it's not exactly a good way to inspect your work area. Like, I didn't know that there was this other, um, you know, undesirable punchy snow over at the left side of the run, which is exactly where I landed. It caused me to pitch forwards onto my head and neck. My feet came up over top like a scorpion tail. And if you can imagine, all the pressure just went to my neck and then just like, bang, it dislocated and broke and shifted my, do you know, um, Larry, those Pez dispenser candy machines? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I... that, been... that was me. <laughs> Oh God, Mike! I, I mean, this is not obviously the first time I've heard this, and uh, and all, but um, it, I, it's not getting a lot easier, I must say, over the years. Uh, your this story and Gary's Kenny story, um, you'd think by now I'd be immune. Yeah, but, it was, um... You know, I I remember hearing about it. Uh, you know, back in Canada, and you know, just uh, going wow. Um, it, now this part, you know, the, the next part for reasons I can't quite explain, I, I, I never had any doubt in my mind that you'd recover and make it back. Um, I don't know why, uh, but I do remember saying, well, he's going to be work. He's going to be doing, he's going to be work. He's going to be doing working for safe start now. <laughs> oh my God. It's not, this is not how, this is not how we wanted it to go, but, uh, um, <clears throat> you know, so but, probably... the, but I'm really oversimplifying that, uh, that recovery part from being a quadriplegic to being like, you know, like I, you know, when I got that big thing, but, you know, taking you hella skiing again and getting you out there, getting you out there in the snow and in the, in the back country and getting well enough so that you could actually do that. I mean, that was, that was an incredible achievement to go from zero to that. I mean, it didn't take too long either. There's a, there's a lot of risk involved in doing a, a spinal surgery to begin with, but it was really my only hope for um, recovery. And it was the catalyst to me spending three long months in the hospital. And I can assure you it was not all sunshine and rainbows, but it, it was, um, for most people that know me, they don't even know that I, I've had a t an injury like this or that I'm literally already living on borrowed time. And I started out today by saying, I'm grateful to be here because I really truly am <laughs> lucky to have this second chance. And it, I, I walked out of the hospital after three months. It took me six to seven weeks before I was even ready to take a step. But I, I worked, as you said, very, very hard. And I remember coming out of the, the hospital um, victorious, if you will. And one of the, one of the first calls I made when I was ready to start taking back my life was to you. And I said, Larry, I think I've got a I think I've got a good safe start story now. Yeah, <laughs> well, no kidding, no kidding. Now, the um, the the thing is, is that you did you did make you know you did make it back. You know you you know you, you it was a long haul. I mean, but you got to the point. I remember yeah. once seeing you in the gym and you're on the treadmill, and I'm going, you know, Mike, you're doing, you're doing, you're doing, you're doing great. I mean. 
you, you know, you weren't necessarily better than me yet, but it was obvious that pretty soon you were going to be. And you said, yeah, well, I can't feel from my knees down to my feet yet, but, you know, it's, it's getting better. You know, I'm like, how do you do that? You, how do you run when you can't feel your feet? Um, but I didn't really get into it too much. So, it, it, you know, I, I don't want to make it like sound like a Shazam. You went from breaking your neck to uh, being in front of the class. I mean, I remember even the first, the first days at St. Joe's High School when you guys were teaching safe start there and just, you know, the, just being on your feet all day in front of the class, how tiring it was. And, you know, I, how had, to, I had to have a stool in the classroom. I was on, I had uh, walking crutches or a cane at any given time. I still don't have full dexterity in my hands or feeling. I still don't have full feeling on the skin below my waist. Some of that stuff I don't think will ever um, change, but yeah, I was, uh, I think going up to, to St. Joe's in Edmonton, really, uh, it sped things up for me, though, because it forced me to to get out there. And that was one of the greatest opportunities to go and connect with with students and start sharing my story with young people. It was amazing. Not, not to mention that you all you rented, you rented a really nice house and it happened to have bed bugs. And so like <laughs> two o'clock in the morning or the first before the first night, you're going to the first high school for safe start education and you got to go find a hotel call the landlord and then you know they've got to do the whole cover the house and uh, keep the bed bugs out of existence and then move back in i mean what uh, just at, at the end, that high school is still doing safe start you know um which which is incredible you got high schools going up in fort mcmurray um we branched out, got some polytechnic institutes, uh, Northern Alberta Institute of Technology, the School of Trades started. Um, Dodge College, Keanu, some of the um, other schools, the, the, the school district bus drivers, the janitorial workers. We were working with lots of different groups. It was awesome. Yeah, and there's um, the thing that everybody... Uh, you know, was very concerned about at the beginning, certainly with myself, was that I know safety isn't everybody's favorite subject. I mean, I was the one in front of, you know, the 12 angry men on the midnight shift many a time going, you know, there's got to be an easier way to make a living than uh, going to talk to folks who are, you know, not too thrilled with the way the company's been handling safety and not necessarily too thrilled with somebody like me showing up to talk to them about their behavior and, you know, having to try to make it all work. So when people were saying, you're going to teach 13, 14 year old boys safe, like good luck with that. And what I would turn around and tell everybody is that I'd take the 12 and 13, 14 year old boys over the 12 angry men anytime. Like, there was it's almost like a magic number, eh, Mike? Like 15 or 16 years old. And if you got to them before that, they had not learned to hate safety. You know, like my my errors, my injuries, my responsibility, what's the problem? And I'm like, well, but at the time you're 21, I guarantee you it'll be the windshield wipers. It was the tires. It was the road. It was this other guy who cut me off and took mm -hmm. off. It'll never be you ever again by the time you're 20. And none of us went to a training course on how to diminish or deflect our personal responsibility. But we all got real good at it. And when you're t talking to, the, like, especially like the hockey players and the skiers, I, I found there was a very, you know, accepting, like even with the basketball players that you were, you know, it's not a high risk sport, but when we started branching out into curling and basketball, and I think you guys took it to field hockey, water polo, uh, track and field. I mean, I, I don't know if, how many. Yeah. Curling, softball, you... volleyball, basketball, baseball, um, skiing, snowboarding, mountain biking hockey football tennis work with yeah. rugby players we've done all sorts of uh all sorts of team sports 
Well, and it, although it, the easiest for people probably to see in terms of the, the more from the injuries in the high risk sports like freestyle skiing and hockey and the, you know, the concussions and the knees and so on to performance and to the improvements in performance, um, the easiest sports for anybody to get their head around here, like I said, would be tennis. For instance, reducing double faults or unforced errors in tennis. I mean, they, they even count how many, you know, they'll tell it you and they'll tell everybody else in the crowd how many unforced errors the tennis player made, right? So that's obviously one aspect of performance. And some errors, obviously, in terms of line of fire, bounce, traction, grip, can cause injuries, as you uh, quite demonstrated for us there, Mike. <laughs> yeah, I, I started. <laughs> good, I started good, on, good on that. <laughs> oh, my, I'm so lucky to be here and have this the opportunity to, especially with Safe, start to make a difference. Because I started um, doing this thinking if – I could prevent one accident or injury like mine from happening to someone else. It would all be worth it. And I'm confident that I've done that. And then some probably, but, um, the, uh, even when you go back to the days of BC team, I remember thinking like these States just, they're causing problems and injuries. Like one example was an athlete, Jake, who was poised to go up to the provincial elite and national team level. He was skiing in a half pipe competition, just finished the official training part, had done all of his most difficult tricks. He was ready for the event and he didn't show up for his first run of the contest. And I had to start making phone calls and say, where is he? What's going on? It was sort of, you know, 45 minutes, an hour had passed. And I found out he was in the infirmary. He was down with the, the medics because he'd, he'd just turning around on the snow from from skiing backwards to forwards he'd caught his downhill edge and had a whiplash motion and concussed himself on the cat track not more than 100 feet past the half pipe at the bottom i just said goodbye to him i'll see you for your run and he concussed himself and he missed three weeks of of um, skiing which included two more contests and he didn't make the national team the next year but when we started talk, so I came into this thinking if I can help uh, prevent those, then that's what we need to do. And it's all about human factors because even in um, in sort of high risk environments like freestyle skiing, the mistakes are rarely happening with the highest degree of difficulty tricks because there's a lot of stimulus there that demands or commands your focus. You can't you can't not think about it. So you're you're in the moment. Your eyes and mind are on task. You're you're there. You're present. You're mindful. Now, it's the times where you're complacent or you add in other states like the rushing, the frustration and the fatigue where um, we're starting to see more problems and the problems aren't just causing injuries. They're uh, compromising focus and, and, and mindfulness in the moment when you need to perform. And <clears throat> the, the feedback we started getting from the athletes, and as you might imagine, was that the mental game piece was more important. And I go to coaches now and I say, okay, um, on a scale of one to 10, how important is an athlete's mental game on the day of contest or the, at the game when it's the, it's the championship game, you've made it all the way through the tournament. There's no more time for practice or repetitions in the gym. How important is an athlete's mental game and fortitude? It's like yeah. a 10 or nine or a 10 out of 10. And then I say, okay, so how much time have you put into training their mental game? compared to their physical, it's usually like a one out of 10, the inverse. And then I say, okay, so. Well, Mike, Mike, um, but they don't need, because they've got the lucky socks, right? I mean, yeah. this, like this is the whole thing in terms of athletes in the zone is that anybody that's been an athlete is well aware of the power of the zone. You've been in it and everything flowed. And in my case, the three ball was nothing but net. It was going in all the time in your case, the trick landed perfectly. And by the way, everybody, like the thing he was talking about with Jake going frontwards to backwards on skiing, if you've skied only a bit, you might think, wow, that's pretty difficult. Um, this is no difficult, more difficult than a, a skater going frontwards, backwards playing hockey. I mean, it, for these guys, it's, uh, it, it's something they've been doing sort of all their lives. Um, 
but you could catch an edge and you could hit your head just like you could slip and fall on the sidewalk and hit your head. But this was, as I said, this was what we were going in there to prevent and to help with. It wasn't insignificant in terms of the numbers in these sports, but there was more, Mike. Like I remember Emma Whitman, um, who was on the, just on the provincial team telling me that, you know, I, I get scared with these big jumps, Larry. I mean, I do, but I know that, you know, rushing, frustration, fatigue, complacency, I checked that off, and now I know that 80 90% of the risk is, is going on now. It's just a matter of me and skill and focus, and I know I can do this jump. I've got it. I've done it in practice, and it really helps me reduce the clutter or the distraction, and then they started doing better too. I mean, like this is all part of it, Mike, right? You know, you, you know, you, at the end of the day, if you don't have gold medals, silver medals or bronze medals, you don't get to go to the next Olympics. And it's just that simple, especially if you're Canadian. So, you know, you've got to have a chance of making it on the podium. So the performance started to happen as well too. You know, Simon D'Artois won a gold medal at the X games and things like that. You know, some of the Olympians started to do really well. And it started to spread to the U.S. snowboard team. I mean, we, you know, things were things were sort of really moving moving along. And yeah. I I remember going, well, look, you know, let's see what's happening. Like, because we hadn't been doing this really. Like, we'd been here and there hearing anecdotal comments from clients in industry about improved quality or about you know production efficiency or do decrease customer complaints but almost always what they were sending us was the total recordable injury rate graphs right you know and whether they got a 40 60 whatever percent decrease so i started going out to industry now these were really good companies as well too and um that's where we started getting data on like the 53.5 percent decrease in cost per ton and the 70% decrease in unscheduled downtime and the 48% decline in customer complaints. And these are, you know, these are from companies like one of them, Scott Forge, had won the safest company in America two out of the last seven years or something. So, you know, really strong indicators. And it makes, and I went, well, yeah, as if you're, you know, you're never trying to get hurt, but you're not trying to make any quality mistakes either, right? And so then we kind of went back in and now we're dealing, well, and you were helping me with this here. We're now dealing with like the Carlton Ravens that are on their third year of safe start and the curling teams where it's all about the miss, right? That's all there is to curling is making your shot or missing the shot, right? You know, it's, um, it's not like you've got a goalie that you've got to get the puck past. And, and that's when we really started to hear the almost all of the comments from the second and third year athletes were, were much more focused on performance. So, I mean, I know I was sort of there in the background and, and you know, helping a bit with it financially and all, but what was the, what was the main reason or the, you know, the point where you decided to make that pivot if you will from safety and performance to performance and safety well we've been uh operating under the sort of banner of safe start athletics for the first two years it with the edu education team and i'll relate it to industry for our listeners because um when you start talking about performance and safety, um, your audience really matters. So if you're talking to leadership, operations, management, um, production, quality, and efficiency are incredibly important. And they're great motivators, especially to um, initiate a behavioral shift or, or a change in, in programming. But when you go to the employee group, that may not be as important to them, to them, their family safety, their safety. Um, taking safety home to their families, those are important motivators for them because their family safety is so incredibly important, more so than their own, as you know, Larry. Yeah. And with the athletes, um, we, I, what do you think is more important, their safety or performance? 
Well, this is the ironic part, Mike, because so many of them are well aware that if they're hurt, it will affect their performance, maybe even in their career. But the reality is they're not in the sport to prevent getting hurt. They're in the sport to excel, to achieve. If I didn't want to get hurt, I wouldn't play hockey in the first place is basically the way it goes. So, you know, I think, well, carry on. In sport, much like in industry, it is always safety first. Safety is the most important thing, right? And then you ask a coach or you ask an athlete, <clears throat> what's more important, the, the medal or um, a player injury? And if a coach, and I've asked coaches this time and time again, I say, okay, well, if safety is truly more important, why is it that you've played it? And I can say it confidently now, because I used to start asking people, had you ever put a player on the ice or the court or the field with a taped wrist, an ankle, any sort of injury that they're already managing? And the answer is always yes. So I say, okay, well, what's an injury that could easily be exacerbated by another stress? Yeah. So, and just because you put a star player back in when they're not, and they're not at a hundred percent is what's more important, safety or performance. And then they have, well, this I've never put, their your put, your star, put your star player back in when he or she was still too tired, but you, you know, you did it anyway. Right. You know, and you, and but, so it, I, like, what's a bigger problem? Um, showing up to a game without your head in the game. So having uh, distra- internal, external distractions, compromised uh, decision making, mental, your mental game is, is compromised or showing up on a pair of crutches. One is arguably a bigger problem for an athlete. You can fix the mental game piece in the moment or as you progress. But if you show up on crutches and you can't play, you can't perform, period. So what we started doing with Head Start Pro was going after this. How do you control your state so you can control your mind? And if you can control your mind, you control the moment and the performance. But it comes back to um, arousal regulation, internal and external distractions, controlling those things so that you can keep your eyes and mind on task. And we're almost cresting the hump just to get them back to the baseline of peak performance managing those um the harmful states that can compromise your performance or cause an injury gets you to the baseline of what we call flow state because if you self-trigger on those states even the fear sometimes with the skiers that was working if you self-trigger the fear and you kind of release that because you're also releasing you yourself need, you, need the adre- you need the adrenaline right Mike, maybe just back up for everybody and mm-hmm. talk about I mean, it's it's not all hard, hard science yet, but more and more is coming to the fore in terms of, you know, if you will, the neuroscience, the brain chemistry behind flow state. But in a nutshell, there's got to be some risk. There's got to be some adrenaline and some heart pumping in the first place before you're likely going to get into flow state. Um, but not you can all. Set it up. You can not set all. it up with other... You can set it up with other constructs. So um, setting clear goals and objectives is really important because then you're not activating your prefrontal cortex to try to figure out what the goal of object or objective is as you go. Setting a, a time frame where you can release that worry. So you just you just kind of operate. You want to go from a state of conscious processing to subconscious action. Your action and awareness meet in this higher place where you're trading off energy expensive thought processing, which happens in your prefrontal cortex for subconscious um, action, which is automatic and you've got heightened senses. So you can, you don't actually optimize all parts of your brain. You decommission parts that aren't needed. So your proficiency or your habits need to be at a level where they're automatic. That's why skill development in sport is so important. It needs to happen without thinking about it like a reflex action. It would happen in in uh, in in a safety environment or an environment with a lot of risk, but you want to make it so that the athlete's not having to do too much thinking. They can just act and they can just do. And 
stimulus is really important as you were saying. So when there's adrenaline or fear, that sort of, you can't avoid having your eyes and mind on task when that's there. So intense focus is part of the flow state or being in the zone. Some athletes describe it as being like a, a narrowing, like a tightening of focus where they've kind of got horse blinders on and they're super in tune with that one, one uh, line of thought or that one thing. But some athletes like Kelsey, you Super, also, you also, won an Olympic gold medal, they describe it as a, as a broadening, like you're super in tune with everything in your environment. So your awareness is much broader. So it can be different for different people, but we know it's consistent for everybody is when you're internally distracted because you're in a state of fear, panic, um, sorrow, rushing, frustration, fatigue, um, those states override that and make it so you can't even, you can't release, so you can't get to the baseline of this flow or this subconscious state where you're optimized for performance. Well, I remember hearing it first put to me is that, uh, you know, they, if, if you, if the rushing and the frustration take over, they'll hijack your amygdala right down to the subcortex or the lizard brain, which may not be where your baseline habits, like so depends when you started playing tennis. If you started at three or four, you might have an awful lot of baseline habits right down there in the lizard brain, right? Like the kids who played hockey before, you know, they can't remember when they learned how to skate. My kids can't remember how they learned how to ski, that kind of stuff, right? So that's a big, that's a big part of why starting these things early, these sports early is a big, is a big, big help, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of, you know, where did these neural pathways all start? But if you get the amygdala hijack, then you're not likely going to get all the new skills and things like that, that you've been, you know, all the rest of it, right? So you've got to learn to control that. And I remember, you know, Christy Richards, who was a two-time Olympian telling me, you know, we got told control the mind, control the moment, control the moment, control the performance. That's sort of mantra in high performance, peak performance sports. But we didn't get taught how to control the state to control the mind. And self-triggering really gives you the beginning of how to start working on that skill and developing that skill and that mind control. But it, it seems too, though, from some of the athletes, Mike, that they took, I don't know if they took it further or if, you know, that, that getting that gear engaged was enough for them to be able to keep turning, for them to keep turning the wheel. But as you started moving this, I mean, I, I know obviously COVID was a huge problem in terms of going to do, you know, in-person training for athletes. The athletes didn't have anywhere they could go to train and there was nobody to go per, play the game in front of for the longest time either. So, I mean, from a business point, from a business point of view, I, you know, I can see why it didn't just take off, take off after March of last year. Um, but you made another, I don't know if you will, strategic or critical decision in this, which was to be able to make this available online to people. And I know part of my objective in this was to say that, you know, you, you really, we're really not at the right end of this in a way, Mike, because the house league athletes and the, the not quite ready for primetime players, if you will, you know, they're never going to get any mental training at all. Never. Whereas if you make an Olympic team, I mean, you got, you know, you'll get to talk to Dr. Penny Wardham or somebody, you'll get to talk to a high level sports psychologist. Um, the guy that you were working with out on the island, I can't remember, Dr. Cole, I think, I, you know, there's, you, you do get access if you're good enough, but you got to be pretty darn good to get access to a performance psychologist in the sporting world. And yet so many people could take advantage of just, you know, just some simple, some simple basic tools. So I know, I know part of what I wanted to do was be able to make it available to, you know, to kids, to athletes everywhere, not just, not just the stars and the chosen, but how has that all gone, you know, in terms of the hybrid delivery and in terms of putting more onus on the coaches 
to carry the training and the learning and, and all, you know, in other words, you've changed the learning design significantly. So tell us about it and tell us how it's working. Well, yeah, COVID wasn't uh, exactly good for anybody involved in in-person training or event-based <laughs> business, but um, our online offering has uh, shot way up during the, during the pandemic. And, um, the idea with putting uh, training online and making it affordable is that it makes it accessible. And because you're right, those sort of house league athletes, the developing young stars, they're, they're not getting a lot of access to even base level mental training. Every coach has a certain amount of mental game. They do. And they, and they work it into every practice just with the way that they, they talk and think. But um, it's, it's not often with um, focused intention. Yeah. And so we made a coaching course that it's, uh, you can find it at www.go.headstartpro.com. And that piece gave the coach the skills to start having conversations with athletes that are um, practical and process driven. And then we made the athlete program so that the coaches don't have to teach the athletes everything. The sustainability of the program comes from the coach having the conversation following because two and a half hours of online learning for a young person is going to work for a, per a period of time. But to have um, sustainability, that coach is important. And we had coaches at at the University of British Columbia, the the women's basketball coach. He was one who said that it was a game changer for them. He actually said, I don't know if coaches can get into the flow state but I was self-triggering on my frustration and my fatigue. And when we met at the, at the half, I had a, he had an opportunity to talk with the girls and they came up with a new strategy that was all centered around self-triggering on frustration, putting that aside and then just focusing on defensive on the defensive and defensive plays. And as long as they get three stops in a row and continue on with that as their game plan, they, they might have a chance of beating an under like the uh, team that was much better. They were the underdogs and they came back and won the game. And they were, it was like the odds of that happening were incredibly, incredibly low <laughs> according to this coach. And, but he was using the concepts and, and there's a, it's like, it's an approach to mindfulness and uh, improving mental game that's process driven. So it could be um, reproduced over and over again. And you wouldn't need to talk to, a sports psych or uh, a high performance consultant. Although some of them that we have worked with that we've teamed up with really love what we do because it is that sort of, it's not everything and it can't replace those guys, but it'll help the athlete get to a level in their sport where they can access a high performance consultant or a, a sports psychologist. Cause for instance, Cassie Sharp wanted to mention her earlier. She took a, a train, the trainer, I believe, and we've uh, I've chatted with her plenty of times about these concepts. But she's a uh, she's the reigning Olympic champion in halfpipe skiing. One of the athletes that was with me on that day in 2000, 2013, who's gone on to succeed at the highest level, literally the world's best, the Olympic champ. And um, I don't know if we uh, if Head Start Pro had anything to do with that. <laughs> it might oh, be a bit yeah. of a There's a lot involved, but can't say it hurt. Well, I, mean, I wouldn't say it had more to do than Kathy, than Kathy, you know, had Kathy Sharp had to do with it. That's for sure. Yeah. I think she's the, uh, she's definitely in the driver's seat. But uh, all of, you know, the whole idea that you, you know, for instance, a lot of coaches have a certain amount of intuitive, you know, and it, like they, they know it's probably better to kick penalty goal practice shots at the end of practice than it is at the beginning of practice because if the game's tied you're going to be kicking penalty kicks at the end of the game when everybody's tired but they may not have actually done that too they may have just said it's we do it at the end of practice because it was convenient i don't know if our coach made us shoot all those foul shots at the end of practice because he wanted us to be able to shoot foul shots when we were tired and frustrated at the end of the game or whatever but you know that's that is when we did it so i said there's a certain amount of this that might be intuitive for a lot of coaches and there's some that might not have been purposeful as you've said it might have just been 
accidental that we did stuff like this. But to be able to take it the one step further and to have everybody on the team realize that every technical foul you get in basketball is a self-triggering failure. Like you did not self-trigger before you opened your mouth and looked at the ref and said whatever it was you did, right? Mm -hmm. And so instead of people saying, hey, you've got to learn how to control your temper, it's basically just, hey, you know, you got to self-trigger a bit quicker, right? You know, work on that skill and it make it, working it on the skill makes it less personal. It's a lot easier more objective now the coach player relationship the player it doesn't it doesn't increase the frustration pointing out someone who's mad uh, that they're mad is when they're mad is not generally a good tactic but if you have some some substance behind it it really helps well i remember Keza, you know Keza is now playing pro basketball in germany mm -hmm. um you played for the the raptors nine 905 league i think for uh, a, a year or two and you know and and he was telling me about, you know, not rushing your jump shot, right? Like we all know you got to release the ball quickly, but not rush, you know? And so he was sort of really breaking out the, the, the performance components of this. And then he told me in the interview, he said, you know, when he was with the 905 team, you know, somebody would make a mistake and he'd just look at them and go, oh, that's just complacency and fatigue. Or he'd go, that's just rushing and frustration. And eventually they said, "What? Where are you getting all of this, anyhow?" And he said, "Oh, we we took this stuff for uh, you know this Head Start Pro stuff and Safe Start Performance for three years at Carlton, and uh, you know he said it's also like said like for driving your car. He said it's really good. <laughs> so yeah. you know the <clears throat> the idea that he now just takes it for granted that this is part of life." And it is part of life. Rushing, frustration, fatigue, complacency are going to be around a long, long time after we are gone. <clears throat> but learning how, to, learning how to deal with it, accepting it, all the rest of that for him, you know, it's just he just sort of takes it for granted now. And he even told his friends, they say, yeah, you can go, you can go check it out online. Um, you know, I know certainly for a lot of the folks. Um, listening, Mike, they may have connections or friends, coaches involved in minors in minor sport at, at whatever level, um, you know, whether it's a rep all star level, national level, or, um, you know, you're looking after a house league, house league hockey team, um, provided mm -hmm. they can read at about a grade seven level, I think, um, they can probably uh, they can probably take the course, Mike. So I, I don't know. We've got just a couple minutes. Um, could you tell people maybe just a, a bit about the course, how long it takes, um, where they can find it? Uh, we can certainly post it uh, up there. I don't know if you can throw it up on the screen, Mackenzie. I mean, it's I think it's just headstartpro.com. I don't know if it could get too much simpler. <laughs> But um, go, go dot headstartpro.com. But yeah, the the coaching course comes in uh, two parts. So there are seven modules in the first part, which teaches all about the state error pattern and then the critical error reduction techniques for enhancing performance. Part two goes more into practical coaching tools like anticipating error, rate your state, sharing stories like like we do in Safe Start. And um, the athlete model. Just, just, can, can you tell them just a bit about rate your state, Mike? I don't know if we really covered it. I don't yeah, so rate, rate your state is um, it's a regulation tool that the coach can use to help the athlete sort of uh, get their, their physical and mental states under control. So, for instance, if you do have an athlete who's frustrated and you go through a rate your state discussion with them, you go through um, how on a scale of one to ten, how much are you in a rush right now? On a scale of one to ten, well, we're, we're, how, we're how are you? Are, so I'd say yeah. about an eight, an eight on yeah. rush. I know, and we still got we got a couple of questions too. Thomas Bergdorf asked asked a good one or a couple of good ones that I'd like to get to. But um, okay. So um, and then you can ask them to rate their state on a scale of one to ten for frustration and complacency too. But they might say like a I'm like an eight out of ten for frustration, and you can see them start winding back to like a seven, a six, a five because they've been educated about what frustration can do to their mental game and their performance and injuries. So well, it also a, 
also, like I said, with when I had Britt Andrietta on the show, Dr. Uh, Dr. Andrietta, I said, is, is just making, when I ask you to give me a number for frustration, that forces your brain to prefrontal cortex. I said, does that like automatically decrease the frustration just within your brain because you're using a different part? She said, automatically, like you've, you've, you've gone from emotional to having to give something of value, an emotion of value. She said, you can only do that with the front part of your brain. So she said, it's, it's more than, it's more than just, you know, an intuitive calm down strategy, Larry. It's, it's basically forcing you to think about something else other than what's making you frustrated, even if it's just the level of your frustration. Kind of like when I broke my leg, you know, people said, well, you should have been thinking about skiing. And I'm like, well, I was, but I was thinking about where I was going to ski next, not where I was skiing right now. And, it, you know, it doesn't really matter whether you're on channel four or on channel 40. If the real world is on channel five, you're not. It doesn't matter how far off you are. You're still not there. Right. But the rate your state part really helps bring people back to the moment. And it's the only way you can really sort of evaluate your own level of complacency because you can't feel it. So. Just wanted to say that everybody, because that's it's a really important coaching tool that we give that we give to the coaches to work with the athletes, and eventually the athletes use to learn the tool for themselves in terms of being able to anticipate when they would be most likely to make a mistake because of rushing, frustration, fatigue, complacency, or a combination. And these tools they come from Safe Start, so they come from their supervisor tool, tools the supervisors can use and, and and so on. Like we we knew they worked before we ever gave them to the coaches and the coaches just ate them up. It was uh it was excellent. But um but we have the there's the one thing I should throw out to everybody is that there's a big difference between working with coaches and athletes is that you're dealing with willing learners. Like the athletes want to get better, the coaches want to get better, and they all want to win gold medals and championships. And they all know about the zone. And most of them, no different than me and Mike, had no more reliable way to get there than to pull out the lucky socks. We had with this one kid on the team that won a medal at the beginning of the year with those socks and he did not wash those socks for the rest of the season. And I remember we made him keep his ski boots and the socks out in the garage. They could not even be in the guest house and we could not get him. I mean, he ended up becoming like almost a pro skier. really good. I'm not going to mention his name because it's embarrassing. Great kid too. <laughs> Everybody loved him, but we did not love those socks. Let me tell you. Um, but that's, you know, that's the power of the zone, right? I mean, it, it, you know, look at the baseball players, you know, on TV right now, you know, how many lucky charms they've got around their necks and stuff. It's, it, baseball is fraught with it. So, <laughs> Thomas, Thomas asked a couple of questions. His first one was, what was the most important skill or attitude you learned as a result of the accident that you possibly wouldn't have learned without the accident? And, um, I, on just a, a personal level, probably the biggest gift in terms of a perspective shift I've had is living with gratitude every day. Yeah, that's what I would have thought. And yeah. um, a lot of people kind of uh, don't like having their next birthday because it means they're getting old and they don't celebrate, celebrate another trip around the sun. And I say, well, isn't that the whole goal? We're all, you know, like the, the goal is to live a long life. And um, I, every time I, I get a birthday now, I like, I feel like I'm already on borrowed time. So I feel grateful and celebrate it. But I, uh, I live with that on, on a, a daily basis where I'm, I'm reminded that I'm lucky just to get out of bed in the morning and just imagine if you, if you live with that kind of reverence, like, thank you, thank you, thank you. Every day is, uh, is, a, is a gift it just shifts. I, I feel uh, like that's been the biggest thing. And I like to share that with people because if you do sort of develop some of that gratitude practice into your, in your life, and I talk about it with Head Start Pro with the athletes too, because it does, it shifts your physiology. 
Like well, you could, big, if you could sell part, it's a big part of your, it's a big part of the book too. Uh, I, mm -hmm. you know, certainly have, uh, and I, I know people that have spent most of their lives in transformational work, uh, with psychology, sociology, some of it pop psychology, you know, like the Edwardian seminar thing as training from years and years ago, you know, I used to refer to it as the be all you can be without joining the army guys, you know, the, those total kind of motivational speaker guys, but gratitude is part of every one of those things. Every one of those success formulas. As a matter of fact, one guy said he studied it all his life. He's boiled it down to three things. You've got to eat a tablespoon of oat bran every day. You've got to exercise for an hour and you've got to be grateful for what you have. Those three things, he says, are the core. So uh, I, don't, I don't know about the oat bread. I'm not going to uh, go out on a limb uh, <laughs> attesting, attesting to that. I do it. That but, might be a bit more of a superstition. but Well, I do, I do, I do it, but I think it's mostly because I like Quaker oats. Um, the, so uh, any other questions before we sign off, Mike? We should probably, uh, we should probably, it's been over an hour, so we should probably. Uh, this is uh, this is one that's really important. We should touch on it and it's quick. Um, what do successful health and safety managers and sports coaches have in common? And I'd say the number one thing is that they care. They care enough to, it's, it's not, it's not a, a duty that, they're doing because it's written into their job description. They're taking the steps to go above and beyond to make sure that their employees and their athletes succeed and are safe in doing so because they care and they're compassionate and they're committed in that, in that sort of, in that <clears throat> path. So yeah, I, 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 I'd agree. I'd agree. I'd agree with that for sure. And that might be a good note to, to end it on. That was a, that's a really great question one of my favorites and it's one of the reasons why i'm i'm here if i can prevent one injury or accident like mine from happening to someone else then it's all worthwhile and that's sort of my um purpose and involved in doing all of this and so I, just thanks for letting me be on the show and get to share my story because i hope it's helped the listeners well mike no i i think it was i, I think it was great i also think uh you know like again like you know people <laughs> When they see as the IT, IT IT coordinator or producer for a show, you know they might just uh, think it was somewhat limited or limited to that. And there's an awful lot more that you've sort of brought to the table over the last nine, ten years. Um, and and some of it, I think, in terms of you know the this evolution from injury prevention to performance and and realizing that it was. You know, it, it wasn't it wasn't that big a line. Like you know, everybody could see the error reduction, like the double fault, if you will. But it it took and it took us too. It, it wasn't like we saw it instantly either. It was in front of us for a while in terms of the performance improvement, the enhancement, the focus, and and then if you will, sort of the you know the neuroscience behind it all. And then the whole idea of, well, you know, can we package this in a cost-effective manner for the average kid out there who's playing house league sports and hockey and would definitely benefit long-term learning mental skills and, and learning how to control the states, the rushing, frustration, fatigue, and complacency. So, you know, it's a... It's it's been it's been a very very interesting evolution. I really like working with you on all of it, and so you know, not thanks for being on the show, but thanks for all of that as well, um, because the which I think you're you know, obviously like safety, you know, safety is enough of a value in and of itself, but again, they're not in the sport just to not get hurt. And we're not in the manufacturing or the refining business just to not get hurt. We've got to produce, we've got to perform. And so I think putting all of that together and not separating it is, is probably the most important takeaway I've gotten from all of this as well, is that it's all the errors are caused by rushing, frustration, fatigue, and complacency, other than when you're learning how to do something new. 
And it's just that simple. And the sooner you learn how to control the states, the sooner your life's going to be better. So again, Mike, thank you so much. Um, sorry about all the technical difficulties uh, yesterday, everybody. And on October 21st, um, the current president of IOSH in the United Kingdom, uh, James Quinn, is going to be on the show with us. Now, he's the president of IOSH, arguably the biggest international safety organization in the world. And you'd think that I would have wanted, well, he goes by Jimmy to almost everybody who knows him well, not James. But when he started telling me about what he had done with his career, where he had started in construction, the some of the things he had managed, I was really hoping that all of you would be much more interested in how he did that part at the beginning. We're going to get him to talk a bit about what's, what's happening now on the global scene with IOSH for sure. But he managed some incredible mega projects without a big stick. And he did it with an incredible, um, if you will, positive perspective. Um, it, it's really quite a, an incredible story. Um, and yes, he is the president of IOSH, but I think you're going to find, just like me, that the, uh, the beginning years with Jimmy Quinn we're a little are a little more interesting than you know what he's doing. I mean, I'm not saying it's not more interesting as a bureaucrat or that what he's doing now isn't important. I just think if you're like me and Mike, you're gonna find what he did at the beginning fascinating. So hopefully you can tune in uh, October 21st, 10 o'clock with James Quinn. He is the current president of IOSH. Okay. Thanks very much, everybody. Mike, thanks again. And uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in and bearing with us on the technical difficulties. And uh, hopefully we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Okay. It's on Thursday, though. Not quite two weeks, 13 days. Okay. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks, Larry. Thanks, everyone.